wonderful to be on. And uh, I just wanted to welcome everybody again today that you could join us for the Smart Regions uh, Collaborative Workshop on Resiliency, Innovation, and um, and Recovery. So if you're interested in joining the Smart Regions Collaborative or have a question, um, You've had contact information from another uh, number of uh, regions today, and you'll have more. So, but please do reach out to Macy and I um, as you go forward. Okay, um, I'm really happy to talk to turn over the next panel, which is a regional showcase of regions for Mid America, and our moderator is Mark Fisher from the Council of the Great Lake Regions. So, Mark, can I hand it over to you? Uh, thanks, Gene. It's uh, nice to be with you and everyone today uh, for uh, for the conference. Um, and it's my pleasure to have the opportunity to moderate a, a panel that will, uh, which is a regional showcase panel of uh, clusters in, uh, in mid-America, uh, predominantly in the Great Lakes region, uh, which extends from New York to, uh, to, to Minnesota. Uh, just to give you a bit of a brief description of, uh, of the panel uh, that we'll be talking about today, um, you know, communities in the mid-American region are working on a variety of smart city solutions. Uh, targeted to improving outcomes for governments, uh, citizens, farmers and ranchers, nonprofits and businesses. These solutions run the gamut from economic recovery and increasing water quality to improving the efficiency of agriculture and decreasing the digital divide. Uh, this panel today will focus on different examples of how this region is developing smart solutions for residents living in our nation's heartland. Um, we have a tremendous lineup of speakers uh, unfortunately, Eric Drummond, uh, CEO and founder of Innovation Corridor, um, is not able to join us today. But we have uh, some fantastic uh, panelists from across the region, including Jeff Leonard, who is the city administrator for the city of Defiance in Ohio. Uh, Johnny Park, who is the chief executive officer, uh, Wabash Heartland Innovation Network. Uh, Mark Kritz, who is the Western Regional Director, uh, Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. Uh, Aaron Deacon, who's the Managing Director of KC Digital Divide, and Raymond Lay, the Executive Director, uh, McLean uh, County Regional Planning Commission. And just to give you a bit of background about the Council before we get started, um, the Council of the Great Lakes Region was formally launched in 2013. Uh, we're unique in that we're a binational organization that really serves as a platform to bring all levels of government together alongside industry and academia and the broader nonprofit sector to think more strategically about the Great Lakes as both a shared economy uh, between the United States and Canada, but also an important globally significant natural resource that requires special protection uh, for future generations. And, and um, a couple of years ago, we were fortunate to um, uh, work with the City of Defiance to launch uh, our own cluster called the Smart Sustainable Great Lakes uh, Cluster, um, which will provide, again, all of the different stakeholders that I mentioned previously, a unique opportunity to work together to devise a vision and roadmap for accelerating the region's digital transformation and to really drive systemic change in citizen behavior and achieving a smart, sustainable future in our cities and key sectors. And the member-driven cluster will also allow the region to collaborate in not only co-developing and testing smart protocols and standards to support the deployment of ground baking Internet of Things and cyber physical system applications in an open environment. We hope this cluster will allow the region to come together to demonstrate and scale smart solutions, as well as share best practices and lessons learned in, uh, in a non-commercial sandbox environment. Um, it will help take advantage of shared investment and procurement opportunities, we hope, as well as adopting new techniques for measuring and communicating sustainability from the city level to the regional to the national level. So we're very excited to be part of uh, the GCTC. We're very excited to be part of this panel discussion today. And uh, with that, um, I'll uh, turn it over to our first speaker, um, uh, who will be Jeff Leonard, uh, the city administrator from the city of Defiance. And uh, I'm just going to pull up uh, Jeff's bio here. Um, bear with me. Um, so Jeff is a native of Defiance, Ohio, graduating from Defiance High School in 1975. Uh, Jeff earned a bachelor's degree in business administration from Bowling Green State University in 1981 and joined the city of Defiance in 1992 as the financial finance director, having worked previously as the auditor, uh, Tim Ferguson's office, uh, Thomas Ferguson's office and the city of uh, Bryan. In 2004, Jeff was appointed as the city administrator and continues to serve in that capacity. Jeff and his wife, Jane, have two adult children and two grandchildren. 
Uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Jeff Leonard, who will talk about the fantastic work that they're doing around the Momomi River and the nexus between water, nutrients, and big data. Uh, so Jeff, over to you. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate being here today and speaking with you as well as others. Uh, it's actually been uh, an interesting story in Defiance, Ohio. Uh, and just to give you some background, the city of Defiance is about 17,000. It sits in between Fort Wayne, Indiana and Toledo, Ohio. Uh, we're in the northwest corner of Ohio. And um, what we uh, have found in our story is, is that uh, the city some time ago, and, and actually if you look at what our purpose is and what we're trying to achieve, uh, we're trying to achieve um, and promote an innovative and uh, smart solution to water quality. And um, I can tell you where we've been and where we've been is we spent some $40 million on a mandate from the Ohio EPA that uh, really centers around um, what's called a, a CSO, Combined Sewer Overflow, where we separated our sewers and we've actually uh, sat and um, tried to get the, uh, eliminate some 44 re regulators uh, along the Maumee and the Auglaize River. Our city sits at the confluence of two different rivers, the Maumee and the Auglaize River. And uh, what we've done is, as I've said, is we've spent some $40 million already in a mandate. And um, what we found out that uh, that mandate and that expenditure of money have given us is something we absolutely have no idea about. And uh, that's been the frustrating part uh, in Defiance, Ohio. We have spent that money and we've seen very little impact to the Maumee River, the Auglaize River, and we've seen very little impact to uh, Lake Erie. And uh, obviously we have a, a big interest in water quality but we also have a big interest of stepping outside um, our, the box here and create a, a holistic approach to um, really dealing with this mandate. If you look at where Defiance is positioned and the importance of, uh, of Defiance, it, it actually uh, is um, along the Maumee River, which is uh, said to be the largest tributary uh, uh, watershed of all the Great Lakes. So with that, I think we have a big responsibility and we have the ability to impact uh, Lake Erie. And I think some of the frustrating things that we've seen over time, we uh, follow newspapers in Toledo and there isn't probably a day or a week that you can uh, look at, at the Toledo Blade and one of the biggest issues that Toledo has uh, within uh, its waterway is algae blooms, harmful alg uh, algal blooms, and, and this has been something of a, of a problem. But if you expand just beyond Toledo, I think you begin to understand that this little town that sits in northwest Ohio also can have uh, an influence on bigger things within uh, the Great Lakes region. Uh, the Great Lakes hold about 20% of water uh, for uh, the world. And it actually serves about 48 million citizens. So that's pretty impactful. And when you look at a, at a city such as ours of the 17,000 uh, and us sitting in this little silo and worried about uh, our little mandate and spending some $40 million already, I think we're beginning to see that we've had little to, to no impact on water quality and it's been very frustrating. So what we've been able to do is to actually kind of put the brakes on our program. And uh, as we move forward, I think we're beginning to see how the world is changing with technology and how the world has changed for all of us. And so when we look at uh, defiance, we, we sort of have to take inventory of things and we have to ask the question, what is it that we could do or how could we impact uh, this situation if we could at all? And I think that if you look at where we're located, uh, as I've said, we're located at the confluence of these two rivers. 
And that one river is, as I said, one of the largest tributaries of all the Great Lakes. So as we started to look at this, we started to be, it began to see that um, we really have a goal and an obligation, not only to protect our own water source, but we wanna protect uh, the water source of others. And in order to do that, I think we've had to open the dialogue with um, other cities as well. And not just with other cities, but other entities. And, and uh, not just other entities, but uh, the, the farm community. Because I think that that's been something that's been, been um, sort of missing in this equation. So uh, what we've decided to do is, is to really take a look at ourselves and where we sit geographically. The Defiance is surrounded by 6,600 square miles of land, of which, when you look at it and calculate it out, is approximately 85% agricultural. And that agriculture is something that has been somewhat of a problem um, uh, in the farm community because we're seeing a lot of the nutrients and the runoffs in these streams and as we've kind of peeled the onion away a little bit, I think we begin to understand that, okay, not only do we have a responsibility, but I think others have a responsibility as well for this loading and these nutrients and what we're doing to our waterways. So uh, actually what we've done is we begin, begin to, to recognize that uh, we do have this overall obligation to ourselves but we also have an overall obligation to others as well. And part of uh, our overall strategy to deal with this was just not just to incorporate uh, the city of Defiance because what we're finding out mostly is that uh, a lot of uh, municipalities in Northwest Ohio are set in their own little silo and, and they're working on uh, their own structure and they don't really wanna uh, move outside of that. And I think that we've seen that with uh, information that we've received from others. And I think what we're seeing is um, others being very frustrated by the fact that they've had little impact. The one thing that I can tell you is that um, close to a billion dollars has been spent uh, on municipal governments actually separating their sewers and actually um, trying to uh, improve water quality. But what I'm also here to tell you is that those, uh, that mandate has have had little to no impact. And when you look at it, I think that um, you'll be able to see and some of the statistics that we've seen is uh, these point source uh, polluters, such as cities and other entities, they're only about 1% of the problem in this region in terms of, uh, of the impacts that they're having. And what we're finding is about 85% of that impact has been these nutrient runoffs and farm fields. And, and what you're seeing is um, ag has been uh, a real uh, contributor of some of the problems. So when we talk about um, what it is that we're going to look at and see with our approach, we begin to recognize that, uh, look, we don't want to point the finger at, at the farm community. We really don't want to point the finger at any one entity. What we're more interested in in our approach as a city is to fix the problem and help uh, be the solution to the problem. And I think for the most part, the question that you have to ask yourself is, okay, how are you going to do that? Because now the how part really becomes uh, an important piece of this. So in asking ourselves that question, this is what we begin to understand. Uh, what we begin to understand is that Technology can play a really critical, important role to what we're doing. And technology can help us with uh, making good decisions. We know that because we've had enough uh, collaboration with other entities, Fort Wayne, Indiana, for, let's say, that there's a lot of information out there that's already been collected, but it just seems that 
um, everyone's stuck in into a uh, a thought or a, their little silo about collecting the information and it not being utilized in such a way. So we started to maybe dig a little deeper into this. And I think the one thing that we begin to understand, because if we spent $40 million on a mandate, I think the real question has been, okay, how have we impacted it? How have we reduced the, the amount of, uh, uh, of pollutants uh, of concern here? And the answer is we have no idea. So uh, part of our overall strategy has really been to use technology in such a way that um, we have a saying, and it actually uh, comes from a, a, a professor at, at Ohio State University, Dr. Qu Chris Winslow. And, and Dr. Winslow has stated on numerous occasions, if you cannot measure it, you can't manage it. And I think that there's so much truth to that that as we've um, looked at our approach, um, we begin to understand that we can't manage it if we don't measure it. And I think part of our overall strategy with our program has been to take a serious look at using technology. And when I say technology, uh, part of our strategy has been a, a number of different programs. It's not just any one. For example, I can tell you we believe that we can place sensors out into the streams and waterways and get real-time information from those uh, sensors. We already use um, this technology and sensors and information and smart solutions in our sewers. We have smart sewers in our city. We can actually take a look at our sewers and see the flow and then we begin to manage the flow inside our city, which is really an important aspect of um, managing uh, our resources, and in this case, um, sewer flow. So we've already started using it within the city, but we're going to expand it somewhat, and we're actually going to look at um, expanding it into the tributaries, where you see a lot of scientists today that are studying the lake and um, promoting uh, technology and actually collecting information. We're going to help them and we're going to work with people to actually work in the tributaries that are contributing to that flow in the lake. We've certainly seen the power of that technology and connectivity is critical to our overall program. And it's so critical that um, as we move forward through the pandemic, I think we begin to understand the importance of technology and doing our own job from home or uh, using Zoom meetings such as this to convey messages. So uh, I think what we're doing is we're using the internet of things. Uh, we're going to work with the farm community on um, using and adopting uh, their own methods to uh, work with um, edge computing where they're going to be able to measure uh, certain uh, things that are coming into the streams. And we're going to create a collaborative and a partnership with different entities within our region, and that region is Northwest Ohio. And we're gonna do so in a way that we can have an impact on water quality. Uh, we've had numerous conversations with our county commissioners. We've had numerous conversations with other county commissioners and other organizations like soil and water conservation groups. So they understand what we're doing and we're getting the word out and we're using this technology, but that technology is also gonna give us something that most people uh, haven't anticipated and it's going to enable us to, uh, once we improve it to that point, I think it's going to have some side benefits um, like promoting economic development, like promoting uh, quality of life issues within our own community and um, just promoting the, the enhancement of natural resources. So overall, we're gonna use that technology. We're going to do it in such a way that we're stepping outside the box of our own mandate and creating more of a collaborative effort. And we believe that uh, in order to really move things forward and finding these solutions, those partnerships and that technology can be used in such a way that it can give us so many other side benefits 
that I think we can make this community grow and this region grow, and we can have an impact on uh, the Great Lakes region. So That's with great. that, Mark, I'll hand it back to you and uh, we can go from there. But I appreciate uh, talking with you today and it's been a pleasure. That's great. Uh, thanks, Jeff, for that wonderful overview and uh, for, for kicking us off today. And so our next speaker is uh, Johnny Park, who's the CEO of Wabash Heartland Innovation Network, um, a, a consortium of 10 counties in North Central Indiana, uh, devoted to developing the region into a global epicenter of digital agriculture and next generation manufacturing uh, by harnessing the power of IoT. Uh, prior to when Johnny founded, scaled and led a uh, successful exit on ad tech uh, company Spensa, uh, focused on smart IoT devices and data analytics to help grower, uh, growers better manage agronomic pests uh, such as insects, weeds and disease. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Johnny to tell us a bit more about uh, Win and uh, looking forward to uh, hearing more. Johnny, over to you. Thank you, thank you, Mark. Um, so good uh, afternoon or good morning. Um, my name is Johnny Park, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, as Mark mentioned, I'm the CEO of WIN, uh, Wabash Heartland Innovation Network. It is a, a 501c3 nonprofit organization that was created uh, with the generous support of Lilly Endowment, uh, really to cultivate a regional ecosystem that empowers globally competitive businesses to plant and grow uh, in our 10 county region in Indiana. Uh, next slide, please. So fr from the get-go, we knew that uh, we have to leverage our unique assets in the region. So specifically, we have two uh, major industry clusters, um, agriculture and manufacturing. And another unique asset that we have uh, are two major research and education institutions, uh, namely Purdue University and Ivy Tech Community College. Um, and we're betting on IoT, the Internet of Things technology, this this emerging technology that, that is already transforming uh, virtually all industry sectors. Uh, we believe especially so in agri agriculture manufacturing and utilizing that technology to develop our region, our 10 county region in Indiana into a global leader of digital ag and next generation manufacturing. A very, very ambitious goal for sure. But with this goal in mind, uh, we agreed that the first and foundational step is to accelerate the adoption of IoT technologies by local farmers and manufacturers. And for that, we've developed the Win Alliance model. Uh, next slide, please. So um, the, the Win Alliance really is, the, again, like I said, the whole purpose is to think about how do we accelerate the adoption of IoT technologies by local farmers and manufacturers. We have about 4,000 farmers and about 400 manufacturers in our region. Next slide, please. So the Win Alliance model starts with Win. Again, we're a nonprofit organization vetting innovative commercial and near commercial technologies that would benefit individual growers and manufacturers in a region. Uh, once vetted and we establish a partnership with that partner, tech partner, Win and the tech partner work together to accelerate the adoption of the technology by reducing the cost substantially in the first year or two. Uh, this model also advances the development and innovation of the technology by accumulating all the data that's been produced by these products that we aggregated uh, and we make it available for non-commercial research institutions like Purdue and Ivy Tech for research and education and workforce development purposes. Um, besides directly supporting uh, these businesses in our region, 
this model also serves as an attractor for the tech companies vetted by WIN, right? Uh, from their perspective, we have uh, a model or a network that helps them rapidly develop their products and business models in a very unique, large scale living lab uh, that includes a research university. So it's a rapid uh, customer discovery as well as product iteration uh, in our region. So the goal really is for those companies to establish a physical presence to create jobs in our region and that is already beginning to happen. Uh, next slide, please. So over the uh, past 18 months, uh, we have 30 farmers who represent 140,000 acres of farms and 13 manufacturers that together employ about 12,000 people in the region have joined the Win Alliance. In addition, we have partnered with six tech companies that you see on the slide. Uh, whose products are mainly based on network sensors and digital technology. Um, and again, this is all in order to accelerate the adoption of technologies in our region. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we're also very um, excited that WINS board recently adopted a broadband strategy that would allow when to utilize the same living lab model to accelerate the use of innovative connectivity technology um, that it has successfully used for network sensor technology and ag and manufacturing, right? So what we're doing is we are identifying promising and innovative broadband and connectivity technology uh, that is specifically designed for rural broadband and sensor connectivity. And we're putting that technology to real use and we're going to gather data about its performance so that the rural divide can be addressed quickly and affordably. Um, and the first technology that we have chosen to deploy in our living lab is an RTO wireless aerosite that you see on the picture. Um, it's going to utilize uh, two spectrums that are newly available. Uh, and particularly well suited for rural broadband and sensor connectivity. This uh, aerostat is a, a tethered aerostat operating at about 2,000 feet in the air. Uh, it has about payload of 300 pounds uh, that allows this aerostat to have multiple um, telecommunication radios in the air. Again, we are uh, testing out LoRaWAN and CBRS radios on this aerostat. And because of its height, um, it has an incredible line of sight coverage that, that far exceeds the traditional terrestrial towers. And we're estimating that one aerostat can cover comparable to eight to 10 terrestrial towers. Uh, another interesting application is that it's got ability to reach the areas uh, as a, a wireless backhaul uh, that are traditionally very difficult to reach. So in summary, WIN is developing our region, our 10 county region in Indiana as a living lab for innovative networked digital technology. Uh, with particular attention to the region's key agriculture and manufacturing sectors. This model uh, benefits individual growers and manufacturers in our region uh, by reducing the cost of adopting these innovative vetted commercial and near commercial technologies. Uh, it also advances a research uh, by accumulating all the data that's been uh, uh, produced by these IoT products and technologies, aggregate them, anonymize it, and share it with research and education communities in our region. And so with that, I will hand it back to Mark. That's great. Uh, thanks, Johnny. Uh, and I uh, really appreciate the overview. Uh, some very interesting technology that you're testing and deploying. Uh, thank you for that. 
next, we have uh, Mark Kritz, who's the uh, Western Regional Director for the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture, a former congressman. Uh, Mr. Kritz is dedicated to public service. Um, since 2015, Mark has served as the Executive Director on the Governor's Advisory Council on Rural Affairs and Rural Development Council. Uh, in this capacity, Mark advises the governor on policy as it impacts rural citizens and serves as the advocate for rural Pennsylvanians to the governor. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Mark Kritz uh, for his presentation. Mark, over to you. Sorry, I forgot to, almost forgot to unmute. Um, and if my audio gets a little funny, I don't have the greatest connection in the world. Um, so I'll turn the video off. You just give me the thumbs up or something. Let me know that I'm not coming through or I'm not coming through loudly enough. Will do. Okay. Um, uh, one, I want to thank all the other panelists because I love listening to the stories because uh, as I'm sure people who are, are on this, you learn so much and you learn new things that uh, you didn't think about or maybe fit into what you're doing that uh, um, you hadn't thought about fitting in yours. And I have to admit to, to Johnny that I just love the name Wabash. I, you know, I, there's something about that name that just uh, I, I really like. But, uh, um, you know, you, you talk about it in your bio spectra. You know, we have an invasive species, the spotted lanternfly in Pennsylvania right now. So uh, I think spectra, you, you mentioned it was something about uh, uh, tracking invasive species or different things like that. I think that's what I heard. Um, and then uh, uh, the aerostat, uh, you know, we have lots of hills and valleys in Pennsylvania. So uh, I don't know how much we've explored that, but uh, that's certainly something that we should be looking into. Uh, but I will try to be uh, uh, as quick as possible. Uh, I'll give you a, a, a quick history of uh, the project here. Um, so when I first saw um, the not notice of, um, of superclusters, I immediately called uh, Jean Rice and said, well, we have one in southwestern Pennsylvania. And she said, oh, is that right? She said, well, what do you mean? And I said, I don't know. I said, but I know we've got a lot of people doing a lot of really good things. And I know that if we tie it all together, it would be considered a super cluster. So I want to be part of this. this. And um, as my bio show, tells you is that uh, I'm the executive director of rural development. So that's a statewide organization. Uh, but more importantly to this project, I'm the Western Regional Director for the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. Uh, and most of you, most people know, have heard of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, and unfortunately for us now in uh, 2020, people think of steel and coal, and that's all they think about when they think of Pittsburgh. Uh, Pittsburgh is actually a very high tech uh, 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 region now. Uh, it can date back to uh, uh, the Software Engineering Institute opening up at CMU. Uh, through DOD funding through Congressman Jack Martha back in 1984 and everything that's built on that. Um, one of the things as we uh, uh, reinvent ourselves, I guess you can say, or as we rebrand ourselves, and, and the, the, the timing of this, uh, uh, this event is so timely because I just got off a call about the rebranding of Pittsburgh, about Pittsburgh Next Is Now, uh, is about promoting the things that we're doing in Pittsburgh. So um, what I was looking at in about the super cluster is that we have uh, a great deal of agriculture in the Pittsburgh region. Um, we don't have the tightest knit food system. Uh, and one of the things that I know uh, and that most people realize is that if you're going to market your region, food is extremely important to uh, the young professionals. Uh, and local food, fresh food, healthy food is very important. And we have a lot of that, but it's not very well tied together. And that's where I started talking about Gene is that we have all these sort of disparate projects going on. We have all these people doing different things. If we could tie it together, it would really be very good for our region uh, and very good for the food economy in Western Pennsylvania, which is something as a state, we're trying to grow agriculture in Western Pennsylvania. Uh, we've lost uh, some of the uh, infrastructure that we used to have, and we're trying to rebuild that now. So this started as sort of an idea in, in my head that we had to do better about talking about food, linking local food to local uh, 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 organizations, tying that all together, and making sure that when people are looking for regions to locate to, 
that that's a box they could check off for the Pittsburgh region. So um, that's where this conversation started. It was about tying all these things together. So we've had several meetings that, that uh, bring together uh, not only uh, uh, people in the food industry, uh, but uh, uh, academia, foundations, economic development people, scientists, and uh, people who are on more of the broker and distribution of agricultural products. The one thing that I would caution about our project is that I believe at the beginning, we didn't bring enough ag producers into our conversation to see what they were thinking, what they were doing, and to make sure that we were addressing the needs. If we're going to build a super cluster, it has to be from the ground all the way through to the final product. And, and that's where I think we were weak. Uh, I think also we bit off a whole lot. Uh, and uh, as I've come to see, we still all have all these great little projects going on across the, uh, the region. And the tying them all together still hasn't happened at the level that I would have hoped three years ago when we first started talking about this. Um, but one of the things that we have done is we've note, noted that there are certain things that are missing as we build this infrastructure, as we, talk, as we bring these people together. Uh, and what I can tell you from, at least from the Pittsburgh standpoint, the foundations in Pittsburgh have been extremely supportive of not only the discussions that we're having, but also uh, the different projects that are funded. Uh, the Greater Pittsburgh Food Policy Council just came out with their strategic plan, and, and I'd like to think that we had some role in making sure that that got pushed through and that got uh, addressed, but uh, that was almost solely funded by the Heinz Endowments here in, in the Pittsburgh region. The Mellon Foundation, the Hillman Foundation, Benedum Foundation have been extremely helpful to us bringing together and making sure we're funding these different projects. But one of the things that the Mellon Foundation funded was through Pennsylvania uh, Sustainable Agriculture is that they held several forums and training seminars for GAP certification, good agricultural practices, because we realized that many of our farms produce, but because they're not GAP certified, selling into the institutional market is not an option. Um, excuse me. So through the Mellon Foundation, through the Department of Agriculture, we were able to coordinate that. Excuse me, one second. <clears throat> drink iced tea here. Um, so um, we were able to help bring that conversation to a head so that other people could jump in and help move those things forward. Uh, in 2018, we passed the first ever Pennsylvania Farm Bill. Uh, one of the, the funding streams that we placed in there, and, and so you have a little bit more background. Um, the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture, for the most part, is a, uh, a, a regulatory agency. We do inspections. We make sure that the food is safe. We, we help make sure that the whole process is put together. We're not really a funding uh, uh, organization, but we do have a couple. Well, what the Pennsylvania Farm Bill was developed funding programs to make sure that the areas that we have identified as shortcomings that we could fund. And one of them was small meat processing. Uh, in Western Pennsylvania, we have a lack of uh, USDA certified processing so that if farmers do want to expand their herds or get into new, new lines, without the processing capacity, there's an issue because you need the USDA certified to get into the institutional. So we put money into the Pennsylvania Farm Bill to, to start to address that. Uh, we worked with Penn State Extension on training programs and making sure that the, the uh, uh, Extension had the training programs, which they did mostly, but that they were getting into the places where we saw a need. And oh, by the way, while we were going through this, one of the big issues that we, we came to realize, uh, and we knew this going into it, but it, you know, it, it really brings it to a head when you talk about the NTIA and N NSF supercluster, is that broadband connectivity in lots of rural Pennsylvania, it leaves a lot to be desired. Uh, we have a real issue with connectivity. And we start, when we start talking about these, these programs and projects to help technology bring to bear better uh, uh, procedures and, and efficiencies, well, if you don't have the connectivity, it doesn't work quite so well. So we've, we've been working with Penn State Extension as well and Penn State Extension has really picked up the ball on this and has really been 
uh, making this uh, argument and uh, bringing the discussion to make sure that people across Pennsylvania understand what's going on and where the issues are. Um, we also help fund uh, Chatham University, which is a, a university just uh, uh, in the Pittsburgh region, that uh, to do an inventory of uh, uh, what we actually have, the capacity that we have, the producers, uh, the uh, uh, processors, the supply, all along the supply chain and also the outlets. Uh, and they took it um, to a, a degree, a very large degree, is that when I started talking about this, I was looking at Pittsburgh as the hub because of the size of the economy in Pittsburgh, the size of the population, the amount of consumers. But what they did was they inventoried out 200 miles, a 200 mile radius, because then we get sort of a gathering way into Ohio, up into New York, down into West Virginia and Maryland and, and, uh, and actually the northern part of Virginia as well to see, okay, what is the capacity we have? What are the linkages that we have? And where do we make sure or where do we need to work to, to bring that all together? And for those of you who might be not know geographically, Pittsburgh sits pretty much in the very southwest corner of Pennsylvania. So it's only a stone's throw from eastern Ohio and northern West Virginia. So when you talk about Pittsburgh, you're really talking about that tri-state region as a place where if you're going to do anything, you need to encompass all those, th all those three states in it. Um, we also had a, 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 another group come in and do an analysis through the USDA census to make sure that the Chatham inventory and what we were discussing all sort of jive together and sort of to, to give us an idea of some of the trends that were happening in Pittsburgh. Um, and just yesterday, and that's why I say this, this, this event today is so timely, is uh, one of the projects that we have been um, working with, funding and fighting for is the Republic Food Enterprise Center, which is located in the very southern corner of, uh, of Pennsylvania. Um, and what that was set up, that was, uh, they received an ARC grant to build sort of a, uh, become a broker or a food uh, distributor to be a hub to help build this sort of supply chain and link local food to the local area. Um, I guess that would have been about 2017 as well when we first started talking about this. And we're talking about that we had to expand our footprint from just their little hub um, to build sort of a steering committee or an advisory committee to make sure that, as I said at the very beginning, one of the things that we, I don't think we did a very good job of was involving producers. One minute. Is that what that means? Yes, correct. Um, okay. <laughs> I know we got directions. I forgot about them. Um, but, <laughs> no, it's okay. Uh, um, so uh, we just had a, a meeting yesterday because we want to expand into the producer network and make sure that we have the actual people who are farming as part of this discussion so we know that we can, uh, uh, that we're doing the right thing. Uh, just uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had the uh, Johnstown, which is where I sit, which is about 60 miles due east of Pittsburgh, is uh, received the USDA grant to do a local food, local places. So a lot of the discussions that we're having on a very broad scale, uh, there's still these projects that are going on. And, and our goal with this supercluster is to sort of tie it all together so that we're producing, we're, so that a producer anywhere can, can supply a, a recipient somewhere. Uh, and that that is where we're really going forward. Um, one of the things I talked about Pittsburgh Next is now the, the new branding of Pittsburgh is that one of their highlights is uh, Food Rescue 412. 412 is the area code in Pittsburgh. Uh, and what they normally do is they link waste food from restaurants and get it into the charitable food system. Well, with COVID, they used their technology and their app and everything that they did to make sure that they were helping supply the entire charitable food system became a key advocate uh, and a key component of that supply chain along with farm to table southwest or, or pittsburgh um, so there are a couple of people that are doing it from a technological standpoint that are part of this discussion it's it's growing it uh, are we where are we are we as far as i would have hoped uh three years ago absolutely not uh, is this a larger animal like i said I think we bit off a little bit more than we could chew. We need to do a better job of, of compartmentalizing and making sure that we're doing the things that we can do strongest and then linking those components together. So with that, I will stop. Thank you.
That's great. Uh, thanks, Mark. There's a lot of great experiences and knowledge and lessons learned there. Thank you for sharing uh, more about your cluster. Um, and with that, uh, now I now have the pleasure of uh, uh, turning it over to Aaron Deacon, who's the managing director for KC Digital Drive. Um, Andrew, sorry, Aaron is the founder and managing director of, of KC Digital Drive, uh, a nonprofit civic organization with a mission to make Kansas City a digital leader and to help cities adapt to disruptive technology change. Uh, he works with mayors, entrepreneurs, and civic leaders in Kansas City and around the world to help build ecosystems that connect infrastructure, emerging technology, and social impact. Um, so with that, Aaron, over to you. Thanks, Mark. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, we were missing uh, Eric Drummond a bit here. Uh, I noticed that we've got like a whole bunch of Big Ten folks and then uh, us in Kansas City, we had some Colorado balance uh, so it's interesting to think about kind of the, the Mid-America showcase and, and what, when, what that means. Uh, re related, our, our Metropolitan Planning Organization and Council of Governments here is called the Mid-America Regional Council. So, uh, you know, when I shared this uh, event agenda with them and said we've got this showcase, they were like, wait, do we have a, a session here? So, um, uh, appreciate, appreciate the opportunity uh, and, and the company. Uh, so, as, as Mark said, you know, this is kind of our mission. We are a, a nonprofit organization. Uh, really focused on on digital transformation uh, as a means for economic prosperity uh, and, and quality of life improvements across the region. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what that what that means and kind of how we look at that. As sort of a uh, I could have probably done this graphic as a as a pyramid, um, but uh, there are a lot of elements to being a digital leader. And so we we started. Um, uh, eight years ago when Google Fiber started building out infrastructure here and we had this opportunity to look at uh, if we've got a really world-class fiber infrastructure uh, what are the opportunities uh, and challenges that come with that and and so uh, you know the, the first layer is obviously having the infrastructure in place um, the the data uh, becomes kind of a soft infrastructure layer but even if you have robust technology and data you know how do you then translate that to impact and so that's kind of the second two, two lines here, you know, uh, really um, both impact in terms of, you know, the use cases, whether it's public safety or healthcare, or we've heard talk about ag tech, you know, how do you see impact in the, the things that we do that, that help people's lives be better? And then how do you sustain those? How do you have the business models that sustain those, both so that those impactful programs um, you know, still exist and they go beyond the pilot stage, which is a lot of where where we and, and others in the innovation cluster kind of focus, um, it, you know, that, that, that is, is, is a great base of activity, but the, the goal is to really have those pilot, uh, pilots that are successful be able to flourish. And then there's also an economic development impact that comes with that uh, as well. And so, if you think of the first two rows as kind of your, your, your base layer, and then you translate that into meaningful use and sustainability, and, and then you get into sort of the more broad impact. Um, and, and as you implement those solutions, how do you do so in an equitable and inclusive way? How do you uh, make sure that the entire population within the region is, uh, is, is able to take advantage? And that's the tech literacy piece. Uh, you know, in Kansas City, uh, we are uh, not totally unique in being a bi-state region, um, but but perhaps unique in uh, how much, how evenly our population is distributed. Um, so we've got 119 uh, different government organizations within sort of the, the footprint of the Mid-America Regional Council, uh, our, our regional planning organization. Uh, and about half the population resides in Kansas and, and Missouri. The other uh, sort of interesting dynamic from a regional perspective is the Missouri side of Kansas City, uh, which has most of our cultural amenities. Kansas City, Missouri is kind of the core downtown city of the region, is, is the, the second biggest city in the state. So from a Missouri state perspective, I'd say the state, you know, capitals in Jefferson City, and it leans a little bit more towards St. Louis. And on, on the Kansas side, uh, Johnson County, Kansas, is probably the biggest economic center of activity in the state of Kansas, even though, you know, it's not the, the biggest city, Wichita is, Wichita is the biggest city. So you've got a really interesting uh, mix of kind of population state dynamics in, in, our, in our metro area. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, kind of throw that out there when we think about what it means to do things regionally. Um, 
our work and, and the place that we kind of fall in our in our regional innovation ecosystem uh, is really driven by this idea of being a, a solutions lab to connect emerging technologies with pressing public problems uh, and and we kind of uh, on, on both sides of that have these uh, community building program uh, line and then then project delivery um, I'll talk a little bit just kind of quickly through each of these so Public sector uh, doesn't doesn't have the capacity to deal with emerging technologies in uh, as strategic a way as we would like, uh, and and again we we saw this with with Google Fiber. We see this with uh, you know virtual and augmented reality. We see it with advanced uh, data integrations and interoperability. Um, we see it with new mobility solutions, and so this is kind of a constant struggle. Um, and, and what we've been able to do and kind of where, where we sit is, is one, to bring expertise from the community who, who understands the emerging technology, whether it's corporate side or uh, universities and researchers um, or, or entrepreneurs, you know, people who have some of that and who are really interested to solve these public sector problems, but, but maybe don't have a natural engagement mechanism. So, uh, you know, on the one hand, we've, we've got all of these kind of resource partners and the other thing that happens with emerging tech uh, is, that, is that it often doesn't have a, a home. Um, it, no, one's, no one's quite sure where to put it, what organization it should live in. It may not be somebody's job. And so uh, we've developed a mode of working where we're kind of able to take, to take projects and, and act quickly. So in terms of our, uh, you know, how we think about Solutions Lab, um, these are some of the national organizations that we work with. Um, the, the Global City Teams Challenge Group, uh, I think, fits in there well also. Um, and that is kind of design workshops, hackathons, reverse pitches, the, the journey mapping work, how we really sort of move from idea to prototype in a, in a design sprint process. And, and the outcomes out of the Solutions Lab are the, the, the project work that we do. Sometimes it's software applications, uh, sometimes it's, uh, you know, programmatic or, or pilot projects with, with the city, research grants, sometimes it's new businesses and, and startups. The community building pillar uh, of our work is, is, is kind of how we're, we're able to respond quickly. So we do a lot of putting communities uh, of practice in place so that we've got the ability to move agilely when these uh, new opportunities come through. Uh, you know, we want to be able to generate new ideas um, and opportunities and, and sort of foresee challenges by having uh, the, the collaborative and the relationships uh, in place uh, in, in advance so that we can act quickly when, when new tech emerges. Um, we do our community building in a few different ways. Sometimes it's around a subject area uh, like healthcare or mobility. Sometimes it's around a technology like fiber or blockchain, and sometimes it's around a policy goal or a problem uh, like digital inclusion. Uh, and, and by maintaining these groups over time, uh, we, we you know, do some of the convening and facilitation work, uh, the thought leadership work and, and the organization building work, um, but we're also well positioned uh, to move those partnerships in, into action. So this is sort of the, the softest outcomes of this direct work. Uh, in terms of kind of relationships, partnership building, um, but it really leads to the ability to do the project delivery work that we do. Uh, and so we will, even though kind of our, our bread and butter business is not to do the project work, uh, a lot of times the projects that emerge don't have a natural stakeholder group or, or a home, or, or they need uh, a little bit of project management or funding support or juice to kind of move them from idea to reality. And so we've got, because we, we cultivate this broad network of partners, um, we, we've got the ability to, to be that organizational home when we need to, uh, to, to fill gaps and, and drive execution. Um, <clears throat> culturally, we've kind of built uh, a, a willingness uh, and, and ability to work in the ambiguous circumstances uh, where you don't maybe know what the outcomes are or exactly what the opportunity is or how it aligns with a longer term strategic plan. And uh, then we've got that kind of resource base in terms of the partners and the expertise in, in different areas. So, uh, you know, those, those project delivery things are, are more the consulting, project scoping, you know, the planning work. Sometimes we'll actually do software development um, and, and the deliverables in that 
you know, are sometimes the projects and the tools that get built, and other times it's more like white papers or research papers or the strategic plan outputs um, that that then lead to further work. So, uh, you know, I referenced uh, uh, you know Google um, and and the public-private partnership with the Fiber Network. Uh, this was 2012, uh, and this is kind of where we you know developed and proved out this model. Um, and I, I don't have a, a COVID slide. I saw one of the questions in the chat. It has been really interesting. Uh, it, you know, we we knew even even with Google Fiber, um, as we as we saw these gaps in the community that we were evolving uh, to fill, we wanted to make sure we built you know a regional sort of ecosystem level infrastructure capacity uh, to to continue to fill those gaps with other new technologies and and. Um, things that had a, a similar sort of Im ambiguous um, environment, but also a, a need for some highly specialized knowledge. So that's been a, an intentional part of our, our growth path. What, what has been surprising um, is, is how well that's lent itself to the COVID-19 environment, um, which isn't a, a tech problem per se, but certainly is <laughs> ambiguous, does involve specialized knowledge, is something that um, when you look at kind of a regional uh, infectious disease response doesn't have a natural home. Uh, you know, public health is really um, driven by, it, at least here, uh, eight, eight or nine different county health departments plus the city of Kansas City, Missouri. So um, we have, have done quite a bit of work actually in kind of the, both the, the planning process as well as some of the project delivery work, uh, working on uh, testing and, and tracing plans. Uh, we've done some work on the tech side around kind of the contact tracing applications. Um, <clears throat> have done a lot of work in communication strategy and thinking about uh, the, the regional way that we communicate, uh, even though we've got plans that are coming out of all of the individual different health departments. So um, it's, uh, you know, been, been an interesting environment. Uh, here's just kind of a, a list of some of the areas and, and partners that we've developed solutions for uh, out of this model. Uh, so sort of, you know, reinforces the, the network nature of what we do. Um, this is kind of a list of resource partners, which I've mentioned these types uh, already, universities, entrepreneurs, uh, these national network partners that we work with. And uh, it is really valuable for us to have things like this Smart Regions Collaborative and have these national communities of practice that mirror the work that we do here locally. And of course, uh, the, the entrepreneurial support organizations and ecosystem players. Um, so that's kind of uh, uh, our, our role. We, we do work closely uh, with our regional planning organization. There are a bunch of other, you know, organizations that have regional purview, um, either from an economic development perspective. Uh, we've got a life sciences uh, sort of convener that, that works again uh, across all of these different sectors that we work closely with on our, on our healthcare. But our, our kind of niche is is really in this you know how do you develop civic capacity uh to adapt to rapidly changing technology because um uh, emerging tech means that you need to act faster than uh either sort of a typical strategic planning cycle or a funding cycle um for for a lot of the legacy organizations who who might otherwise be natural candidates to to do the kind of work that we do um so that's our uh, that's it's our kind of organizational overview. That's great. Uh, thanks, Aaron. Uh, fantastic initiative. And uh, last but not least, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Raymond Lay, who is the executive director of the McLean County Regional Planning Commission. Uh, he's been the executive director uh, since uh, January 2020, uh, so a relatively new appointment. Uh, Mr. Lay was serving as a, before this position, he was serving as the Director of Economic and Community Development for the City of Decatur and the Deputy Director of Economic and Community Development for the City of University City in the St. Louis metropolitan area. Uh, previously, he worked as an Associate Senior Planner in Asia for ACOM, uh, a leading U.S.-based uh, global consultancy, as well as the Director of Planning and Zoning for the City of Edwardsville after holding various pl uh, professional planning positions in the city and the County of St. Louis. Uh, so Raymond, over to you to close out the panel discussion and hopefully we'll have a bit uh, a time at the end to do a lightning round of questions and perhaps one question from the audience. So Ray, over to you. Thank you very much and almost good afternoon some for, to some of the places, almost noon of uh, the East Coast. 
so good morning to the folks uh, Midwest and, and, and the West Coast. Um, like Matt was saying, I took this position about two months uh, before the pandemic hit. So uh, a lot of the cost, you know, the works for the cluster. Uh, I just want to mention that uh, my predecessor laid a lot of groundwork. Uh, and good thing that she's still in the area and working for some one of the municipalities. So there's still some continuity in terms of the cluster. The the journey of our cluster, uh, which is named Bloomington Normal Innovation Alliance, uh, BNIA. Uh, Bloomington and Normal are the two kind of urban municipalities in McLean County. And McLean County is the largest uh, county by land area in the state of Illinois, uh, the land of Lincoln. And it's located between Chicago and St. Louis. So about two hours south of Chicago. So we have the, the county is, is the largest in terms of the land area in the state. Um, but then the urban centers composed of the two municipalities of Bloomington and Normal. And with combined population of about 130,000. Uh, and Bloomington is the headquarter. For, for those who don't know much about Central Illinois, uh, Bloomington is the headquarter, the home to the headquarter of State Farms Insurance Company. Um, and also uh, Illinois Wesleyan University. Uh, the town of Normal is the home to the uh, ISU, Illinois State University, uh, the public university with about 20,000 student population. And then also is uh, the, the location for the uh, Vivian, have you heard of it, uh, which is a, a rifle to Tesla in, and they manufacture uh, SUV, electric SUVs and, and trucks and they just look out for this IPO someday uh, they call Vivian and Amazon has already placed order of 100,000 electric trucks from them so so our region although it's not may not be well known but it's is up and coming with some different different things the so our area is 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 kind of in the central part of the state uh, outside the urban areas is basically rural, a lot of farming, agric agriculture. Uh, there are about some 20 uh, smaller rural communities. And, uh, but the, this cluster, the BNIA, the Bloomington Normal Innovation Alliance, is we have about 15 partners composed of uh, folks from the government sectors, the county government, the two urban municipalities, and then we have folks from the two universities, uh, Illinois State and, and also Illinois Wesleyan University. And also another um, sector is the economic development in the Chamber of Commerce. So we have the, the Economic Development Corporation and the McLean County Chamber of Commerce, as well as our regional, um, what they call kind of regional broadband provider, Central Illinois Regional Broadband Network. Um, so it's covered from government centers to academia, to economic development, to businesses. Um, and on the, on the governmental side, if the, it's not just the, the staff, uh, of course, the IT, the planning staff, uh, but then also we have elected officials. We have uh, administrators, city managers sitting with this group of about 15. So we still currently relatively young. Uh, uh, we just finalized on the name a few months ago. Uh, the group has been meeting since about last year, about 15 people or so. Uh, but actually the idea, uh, the concept of this innovation alliance, smart city, smart regions, really generated from a few years ago from the, the different strategic plans and comprehensive plans of, of the, the different partners uh, in the area. And our goal really is to promote innovation and also to collaborate through research uh, to tie technology and solutions to problems, really to enhance the quality of life and the, and the local economy. And then as we look down the road someday, um, not just for our region, but to other cities, counties, communities, metropolis, um, country, and also someday, someday, 
to the to the other parts of the world. So that's our aggressive vision. We know it's it's but we have to set our vision somehow higher so we can uh, have some some big goal to try to achieve. We know it might take small steps, but maybe come back. We'll we'll share in ten twenty years or something. Um, so one of the benefits too with the universities uh, being the partners, we also try to connect uh, with the the schools and, and the committee issues and problems so that students can engage in trying to find solutions, technology driven, data driven solutions, so that maybe that's one of the ways to keep the students after they graduate to stay in the area and t keep working on the solutions. Um, right now, since we're still relatively young, and we are working on an MOU, uh, Memorandum of Understanding, so that all the partners will sign on, um, so that we have, um, to, to just to ensure that's your know, good communication and coordination on different projects. And the being a kind of relatively young um, organization or, or group, but with great passion, a great vision, because people, really put in their time and effort to come together every month uh, and then st stay in communication, you know, in between uh, to, to work together and, you know, encourage folks to, to participate in, in workshops like this or the smart city conferences and really to uh, branch out. Um, the, but it's still some challenges because we, we're trying to learn. Uh, we, from others, while right, try to seek advices and, and uh, guidance. So any of you, we're not claiming we are the expert, you know, we are the, the Ivy League of the smart regions, but we are open you know, to advices and, and guidance. Um, it's like a baby, you know, we, we, uh, we try to crawl and we want to walk and, and start running someday. And so setting priorities is, is the other thing because with different partners, we try to come together and then, and then each representatives has to bring the ideas or concept to their own uh, organization to get a buy-in and come back. So that, that takes some process. And then another thing is, of course, uh, one of the challenges is uh, budget and resources. So that's probably not uncommon. We don't have, like in Pittsburgh area or, or say of Pen uh, Pennsylvania, so many foundations. And uh, so, but there may be some creative ways and innovative ways to to locate some of the, the resources. Um, and workforce is another area that, that we need to provide a training and education if we want to go that route. Despite if we have Vivian, you know, we're trying to uh, have so many job openings, but we have to get trained uh, skilled uh, laborers, employees, and different professional multidisciplinary um, uh, folks to, to fill those openings. Um, one, one of the exciting or one of the first projects uh, that we really just started is a consultancy contract uh, that we have engaged a consultant in Maryland uh, area. Uh, we need to look at our 5G uh, small cell installation um, uh, in, within the public right way because we want to evaluate how our current regulations, particularly in the uh, Bloomington normal um, areas, how how our regulations uh, are, are, you know, is it ready for the 5G installations? Because we have seen many of the antennas and small cells uh, equipment, you know, want to locate in our right of way. So that's one of the first issues. So as a group, we kind of look, at, you have a joint RFP, uh, work uh, with the consultants, uh, we'll be starting really soon. And we just signed a contract. And so that will be one of our first car pilot project if you will. Um, and so we're looking for other suggestions, ideas, and for other projects that we can help to glue us together, but then also to propel us, um, you know, for the, for the future. So with that, um, just our own story for the time being. Thanks for the attention. That's, uh, that's great. Thank you, Raymond. And thank you for sharing your story. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, so we've got a bit of time left and what I'm going to do is a, a lightning round uh, with the panel uh, because we don't have much time left. And then uh, there is one question from the, uh, from the audience that uh, I will pose. Um, and so why don't I uh, start with Jeff? And uh, I guess the question that uh, I'd like to ask is, 
you know, when you think about collaboration, what is the biggest challenge you've had to overcome? And what advice would you give others contemplating uh, the creation of a cluster? Um, and uh, since it's a lightning round, um, you know, really reflect on, uh, on what your advice would be. So Jeff, over to you. Thank you, Mark. I think the, the first thing that you have to understand in a collaborative effort is, is um, how uh, you can align your resources with somebody else and leveraging your resources with somebody else for mutual benefit. I, don't, I think that if you don't have that, you're more than likely not going to be able to uh, collaborate uh, what you're going to do is just share uh, information, but it's that true collaboration comes into uh, it, it comes into play, and you can really collaborate when you find that you have similar uh, interest and that you can benefit one another. And once you can do that, I think that, and once you can have somebody see the benefits that they receive from what you're doing, and that you can enhance uh, them as well. I think that you're going to be able to uh, move things forward and you're going to get that excitement and you're going to get that catalyst for change. So I think it's great. Uh, making sure you can do both. That's great. Johnny, what's your best piece of advice uh, overcoming challenges relating to collaboration? Yeah. So I think the thing that comes to my mind is making sure there is aligned incentives, right? And just like any other enterprise or startups, when they try to sell their services, you need to have a value proposition very clear and laid out. So, you know, for example, when we work with our three main stakeholders are farmers, manufacturers, those are members, we have university partners, and we have tech partners, the technology companies. So as a farmer, the benefit is hey, you get to use this discounted vetted, vetted technologies. But in return, I would like you to share the data so that we can share it with university partners. University partners, you have this incredibly valuable data set you're gonna have access to research and education purposes, but I would like you to work with tech companies and, and publish data and share those data with farmers and manufacturers. As a tech partner, look, your value proposition is you get to uh, launch your product, uh, we're gonna help you, and you have access to this progressive-minded farmers and manufacturers in the region. In return, you make some investments in our region, uh, you know, create jobs and share some of the revenue share with WIND so that we can sustain this ecosystem. So um, I think having that uh, aligned incentives among all the stakeholders, I think is pretty important. That's great, thanks, uh, Johnny. Uh, Mark, uh, what is the biggest challenge you've had to overcome in terms of collaboration? Um, well, I think part of what we, have come across is make sure the goals are aligned. Uh, you know, as Johnny said, incentives, goals, uh, that you're, you're pulling in the same direction that the players all want uh, the same outcome. Uh, and make sure you're able to identify who brings what to the table so that uh, you're filling the holes of where you might need help. Uh, and then the third um, piece that I would mention is that, and this is from my previous life, is that, uh, uh, a lot of times we're trying to solve a problem because we, we, we say, well, you need this. Uh, the, the more important question is, do they want it? Uh, because sometimes what we identify as a need is not what the person on the other side of that uh, debate wants. Um, so aligning those can be extremely important because you don't want to be moving in a direction that the people you're trying to help, that's not, what, that's not the help they want, sure. whether you, you've identified it as a need or not. That's great. Aaron. I think um, the, the, the advice uh, would be to make sure that somebody has sort of that collaboration as their responsibility, because that's a unique role within a collaboration. And, and the challenge that I think corresponds to that is sometimes people think, uh, and not people, or people or organizations, you know, feel like they are the, the sort of the one that's responsible for the collaborator, but um, it, you, you sometimes have uh, individuals or orgs that don't have the, the skill set to, to do that well and other times they've got sort of their own incentives that keep them from being able to actually be the um, the person that has or, or, or organization that has the, uh, the the success of the collaboration at 
at heart. So that's that's a challenge to navigate, and it's not always easy. I, I don't know always how, how to get around that uh, when you encounter that situation, but I think it's important to be clear-eyed about going into a collaboration. That's great. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, Ray? Um, for us, we have the benefit of we have a culture for our region that we've been kind of working together on different projects, not just the smart region uh, that really came later, but on other fronts we've been working with, with the governmental groups, you know, with the three governmental uh, entities been kind of been meeting for like years on, you know, in looking at projects and initiatives and grants. So we have this history of working together. I think the uh, so it's a lot, of, and also other partners kind of sitting around the table, so it's not unusual for us. I think the challenge, challenge is to bring this smart region, you know, the idea, the concept, what, what are the projects that we all work, can work together and how those projects, you know, after selected or consensus, build on those projects that benefit those different entities and partners. And then the bigger organization behind these uh, representatives can also see that and to get the buy-in from the community. So, so that's something we're working on, but the first pilot project on the 5G uh, uh, consultancy might, will be a good uh, benchmark or test case, if you will. That's great. Well, with that, we're uh, 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 pretty much out of time. Um, and I wanna thank all of the panelists for a fantastic discussion today. I hope everyone has seen what's uh, a little bit more about what's happening in Mid-America and particularly across the Great Lakes region. And I uh, want to give everybody a round of applause for, uh, for joining the discussion today and sharing your experience. Uh, I also hope that people will um, uh, reach out and learn more about the Smart Sustainable Great Lakes Cluster that we are working to create through the GCTC and in partnership with the City of Defiance. Uh, many of the partners, panelists that are, are uh, active in the region today, I think there's lots of lessons we can share collectively and together across the, uh, the Great Lakes region. And I encourage everyone to reach out and help us really form this, this cluster at a larger level. So thank you everyone for joining us today and for a very rich conversation.